Welcome to the visit training session titled Water Vapor Imagery Analysis for Severe Thunderstorm Forecasting. My name is Dan Bikus. Dan Lindsay, Scott Bachmeyer, and Scott Lindstrom also contributed to this particular session. The goal of the session is to learn about the utility of the water vapor imagery in the severe weather forecast and how it blends in with other available data sets. Our learning objectives apply whether you're using 6.5 microns on goes east or 6.7 microns on goes west, using the water vapor imagery to identify short waves and jet streaks, look at cloud cover and clearings for destabilization, identify gravity waves, and also look at storm-induced dark zones. We'll also be looking at the 7.4 micron water vapor imagery available from the GOES sounder. And we'll, for that, we'll be looking at mid-level jet streaks as well as the relationship to the elevated mix layer. Let's first review some basic water vapor imagery interpretation. Remember that the satellite instrument indicates the temperature of the moisture that it sees. What it sees is the net temperature of a layer of moisture. The water vapor imagery corresponds to the net temperature of the moisture in a broad, mid-level layer, usually centered around 400 millibars if you're looking at the 6.5 or 6.7, the standard water vapor channel. And note that the layer that it sees is variable. Now let's talk about jet streak identification. Here's the description of how to locate a jet streak in the water vapor imagery from the NESDIS manual by Roger Weldon. The jet streak is located along linear shaped features such as bands or boundaries in the upper air cloud or moisture field. However, many well-defined boundaries are observed which are not associated with jet stream axes and some very well-defined jet stream axes do not have a well-defined boundary or band feature on the imagery. Ideally, one learns to identify jet streaks in the imagery by looking frequently at the imagery and becoming skilled at this as one gains experience. The terms jet streak and shortwave are often intertwined when looking at these features in water vapor imagery. So to be precise, we show the definitions from the AMS glossary. A shortwave is a progressive wave in the horizontal pattern of air motion with dimensions of cyclonic scale. Typically, we think of short waves as being associated with an area of lift, since they're usually accompanied by PVA. Vertical motions can be created by subsynaptic scale processes. A jet streak is a relatively small region of maximum wind speed in a jet stream. Typically, we think of jet streaks as something that can influence the organization, initiation, and maintenance of storm systems. Jet streaks are associated with severe convection via their vertical motions and coupled adiastrophic flows. A note on color tables, throughout this training session, we'll be using the same enhancement on all water vapor imagery, this one right here, where we have colder brightness temperatures towards the right. Use whatever color table you're comfortable with for your own analysis. Experiment with different color tables, particularly with the 7.4 micron imagery from the ghost sounder if you haven't used it frequently. Let's look closely at a short wave moving from Nevada into Idaho from the GOES water vapor imagery. This is the 6.7 micron channel. And early in the loop, we can see a dark region across southwest Nevada that's moving northeast towards Idaho. And near the end of that loop, you can see some convection developing in response to the short wave here in Idaho. Let's overlay some other model fields to look at this short wave in more detail. First, we'll overlay the RUC 300 to 500 millibar layer of vorticity. We choose a layer of vorticity since the water vapor imagery observes the net temperature of the moisture in a relatively broad layer. Typically, this layer is centered around 400 millibars, so that the 300 to 500 millibar layer of vorticity should capture the majority of the signal we see in the water vapor imagery. And in this case, we do see a warp max associated with that darker region as it moves from Nevada into Idaho. Now let's look at the isotax, the 300 millibar isotax from the RUC. And we can see that a jet streak is associated with this particular area here as well as it moves from uh, Nevada into Idaho. And then we can overlay the surface observations on here 
to look at the near storm environment and any low level convergence boundary where convection may develop. In the previous loop, we analyzed a jet streak that was darker in the water vapor imagery. Now we see a jet streak across northern Mexico moving into Texas that's lighter in the water vapor imagery or cooler brightness temperatures in this case. And the way we can see that is it's a relatively fast moving region through the flow here. And we can also rock the imagery back and forth to get greater confidence that what we're looking at here is a jet streak. Another thing we can do is overlay the model output. This is the NOM 400 millibar isotax along with the GOES derived winds in the 350 to 450 millibar layer, so right around 400 millibars. And this can give you additional confidence as well in terms of the position of the jet streak and also give us an idea in terms of the magnitude of the winds and how much confidence we would have in that by comparing that from the NOM with the values in the GOES derived winds here. Also note that it appears to be playing a role in terms of convection in West Texas here. We'll look at the visible imagery next. Here's the visible imagery that goes along with the water vapor imagery that we just looked at. Note there are no clouds associated with the jet streak of interest as it moves across Mexico into West Texas. When the jet streak becomes juxtaposed with this dry line over here in West Texas, convective initiation occurs. The jet streak also provides a favorable near storm environment for the storm to continue intensification. For this slide, we'll identify any short waves or jet streaks in the water vapor imagery that may aid in the development of convection. The most obvious feature is this dark region that's moving from Wyoming into Nebraska, Colorado, and into northwest Kansas. And you can see convection developing along the leading edge of that from western Nebraska and points southeast. If we overlay the 300 to 500 millibar layer vorticity from the NOM, as we did before, we can identify the warp max that's associated with that short wave as it's moving to the southeast. Next, let's look a little bit later on in the loop. So to do that, I'll stop the imagery and advance along here. And note this dark region right here across Wyoming about midway through the loop. We can trace this back as it's moving through this region right here and across Wyoming in this region here. And we can see convection tries to get going along the Wind River mountain range right here in response to that. And we can see a reflection of that right here. Now, if we're sitting downwind of that somewhere, say here in uh, Colorado, and we see indications of a short wave, we see indications of convection trying to develop here across Wyoming, well that's a sign that we could get later convective development as it moves into this region here if other conditions are favorable for development of convection. And what I'll do here is overlay the isotax, the 300 millibar isotax from the NOM, and you can see there's a pretty good agreement in terms of the position of this jet streak. And also, if we look at the GOES derived winds from around 300 millibars, you can see a pretty good agreement between the analysis and the observed winds here. So if we see what actually happens here, we'll go ahead and advance the loop, and we see this convection develop fairly late in the evening around 4 to 5Z in Colorado. And uh, there was actually quite a bit of severe weather associated with this, including tornadoes and hail up to two inches in diameter. So by utilizing the water vapor imagery, identifying the jet streak that's moving through the region, and noting its potential impacts for convection here, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, next let's look at the uh, low-level environment for the convection that took place here. Here's the profiler data from Platteville, Colorado. You can see the evidence of the upper level jet streak that we just diagnosed in the water vapor imagery. And that came together with these low level easterly, northeasterly winds here, which is a favorable upslope flow, which helps to introduce low level moisture into the region. And with that favorable low level environment, you introduce 
a jet streak into the region here, and those are the key ingredients that came into phase here and produced a severe weather event later in the evening hours. In this example, we see evidence of a strong upper level jet streak in northwest flow across Colorado, Colorado moving towards the southeast into Texas. If we overlay the 250 millibar isotax from the RUC, you can see supporting evidence of this jet streak. And then if we overlay the GOES derived winds around 250 millibars, we can also see a pretty good agreement between the model output as well as the GOES derived winds here. Next, what we'll do is overlay the surface observations to look for the low level convergence boundary. So we'll advance it to this time right here. And we can see a low level boundary with dew points in the 60s just south of that boundary and then drier air to the northwest. And what happens is as that jet streak approaches, becomes juxtaposed with the low level convergence boundary here and we see a storm go up right along that boundary right here. Here's the profiler data from Tucumcari, New Mexico, which is in eastern New Mexico. And this provides additional evidence of the upper level jet streak that we just assessed in the water vapor imagery along with the 250 millibar uh, isotax that we looked at. And we can see that jet streak right around here with a big increase from early in the day over to here. In this example, the water vapor imagery shows a well-defined upper level jet oriented northeast to southwest from New Mexico to eastern Colorado and northwest Kansas and southwest Nebraska. Convective initiation occurs along the juxtaposition of the dry line, which we'll show in a minute, and the upper level jet. The weighting function profile gives us a clear indication of what level in the vertical the channel is seeing. Here's the weighting function profile based on the 18Z sounding at North Platte, Nebraska for the 6.9 micron wavelength, which is representative of the 6.5 or 6.7 micron water vapor imagery. The 7.3 micron weighting function profile is also given, which is representative of the GOES sounder 7.4 micron channel, which we'll be looking at later. The maximum values for the 6.9 micron channel are around 400 to 500 millibars. Think of this as the net temperature of the layer of moisture the channel sees peaks around 400 to 500 millibars with decreasing values above and below that layer. Now this data is available. You can check the CURL button in the controls frame and bring up a web page where you can view weighting function profiles from any sounding site. Let's contrast this green curve here from the water vapor imagery with the purple curve, which is from the sounder or 7.3 micron channel. And you can see that it covers a broader layer, a, a broader depth, and also extends down into lower levels. Now let's look at the imagery that corresponds with this profile. This is the GO Sounder 7.4 micron channel with the same enhancement as the earlier water vapor imagery loop. Keep in mind the nominal resolution of the sounder is about 10 kilometers, while that of the imager, as in the water vapor imagery we just looked at, is at about 4 kilometers. At this latitude, the resolution would be even more coarse. Also, the temporal resolution is hourly which will always be less than that of the water vapor imagery. The advantage of this channel is that we can look lower in the atmosphere than the 6.7 micron channel, so that mid-level jets may appear in this channel. Keep in mind, since the weighting function is broad, we're still including contributions at upper levels as well, just not as much as the water vapor channel. In the imagery, we see a fast-moving dark area over generally the same area that we saw in the water vapor imagery, but also further to the east. An overlay of the 500 millibar isotax from the RUC shows the jet at this level to be along and slightly west of the faster moving dark region, which is right here. Looking a little bit further down, 
at 600 millibars, we see the corridor or the strongest winds align quite well with what we see in the imagery here. Looking even further down at 700 millibars, the jet is further to the east over here. And then we can overlay the observations here to give us an indication of where the dry line is. Let's look at a cross section across the region of interest. This cross section is from the ruck and it shows the wind speed and theta e. We show theta e on here to show the location of the dry line with the moist values or the higher theta e values to the east of that over here. This shows the typical configuration of the strongest upper level winds further to the west with the mid-level jet further to the east that we identified in the 7.4 micron imagery that we just looked at, and then the low-level jet helping to transport, transport the low-level moisture even further to the east using a combination of the 6.7 micron water vapor imagery along with the 7.4 micron imagery in tandem can help identify jets at the various levels. At times, the GO Sounder 7.4 micron imagery can be used to trace the elevated mix layer that can be important for severe weather setups. When an elevated mix layer profile develops, hot and dry air from the higher terrain of Mexico and the western U.S. is advected eastward. Mid-tropospheric steep lapse rates originate on the elevated terrain and are advected as an elevated mix layer over the low-level moist air. The weak static stability of the air mass enhances the upward motion ahead of the advecting cyclone. In this diagram, the edge of the lid right here would correspond to the location of the dry line where deep moist convection may develop. Thunderstorm development as a result of underrunning the cap occurs when unstable parcels at low levels flow out from under the margins of an elevated mix layer as depicted here. Underrunning occurs because of the transverse vertical circulations are so arranged as to promote strong baroclinic forcing of agiostrophic flow and vertical motion along the lid edge. This region can be monitored as the dark area corresponding to warm and dry conditions that exist at mid-level. The edge of the lid would correspond to the edge of the dark region along the dry line. In this example, we see the development during the day of a warm, dry, or dark region right here. In the GOES Sounder 7.4 micron imagery, it advects off the higher terrain to the west and is moving pretty much in this direction towards the northeast. Thunderstorms develop along the edge of this dark region along the dry line in southwest Nebraska and northwest Kansas. Here's the visible imagery along with the METARs that goes along with the loop from the previous slide. The origin of the well mix layer can be seen in the observations. This mid-level warm dry air mass moves northeast where a dry line is situated. Severe thunderstorms develop along the dry line from southwest Nebraska into western Kansas. Here's the Dodge City sounding at 18Z and at 0Z. The 18Z sounding is launched just before dry line passage. The 0Z sounding is launched in the dry air west of the dry line. Notice the warming and drying that occurs at the lowest levels, below 800 millibars. While at mid-levels we, we still see drying, but it's also cooling. Note that the 500 millibar temperature dropped from minus 10 to minus 20. It's the mid-level drying and cooling that helps to steepen lapse rates and decrease static stability. The stable layer, just below 400 millibars, corresponds to the top of the deep mix layer over elevated terrain. This is the 7.4 micron imagery for the next day. At times, the elevated mix layer can be advected well to the east and be a key ingredient for severe weather episodes east of the plains. 
In this example, we can track the dark area associated with the elevated mix layer well to the east towards Illinois. It's important to keep track of the trajectories of the elevated mix layer and inspect soundings, as these dark regions may be observed further east and not be associated with an elevated mix layer from the source region of the Rockies or northern Mexico. Here's the 18Z sounding from Lincoln, Illinois, from the previous example that we just showed. And the objective here is to verify that the dark area that we just looked at is indeed associated with the elevated mix layer. And you can see by looking at the sounding that it is. It has the characteristic dry air at mid-levels and steep mid-level lapse rates with low-level moisture down here. Here's a different case from April 2009. Note the dark region over Texas advecting eastward across the southeast. This is the elevated mix layer with origins over the elevated terrain of northern Mexico and the southern Rockies. In the next slide, we'll show soundings within the dark region as supporting evidence. An overlay of the RUC 600 millibar wind barbs and wind speeds clearly shows the mid-level jet at the leading edge of the dark zone. This mid-level jet is juxtaposed with a front at the surface across the southeast that is responsible for severe weather. And to help illustrate that, we'll look at the surface winds and the surface base cape. For comparison purposes, between model forecast versus observations, we would compare model 600 millibar relative humidity with the sounder imagery, as we show in this overlay here. This comparison can yield greater or less confidence in the model output. This is the sounding that corresponds to the imagery that we just looked at. Remember, we were going to show evidence that we were indeed looking at an elevated mix layer. This is the 15Z sounding from Slidell, Louisiana, and this depicts an elevated mix layer. Remember to use the soundings in addition to noting the trajectories in the imagery to be sure that you're looking at the elevated mix layer. Now let's discuss the dark zone satellite signature that was first discussed in LROD 1989 with a reference on the student guide. The dark zone signature in the water vapor imagery is the result of the convection. In other words, it's not present before the convection. The dark zone envelops the upstream edge of the anvil, cirrus, usually in a C or V shape, but can be circular or oval shaped. Statistically, they looked at a number of cases and found that 69% of dark zone signatures were associated with severe storms. Treat this like any other satellite signatures of severe storms, meaning that if you see the signature that the storm is most likely severe, However, if you don't see the signature, that doesn't mean the storm is not severe. Here's an example of the dark zone signature that we're discussing. And in order to assess this, I'll stop the loop here and move on to this time right here. This is the storm of interest in Kansas. And note, as the storm continues to mature, we get this dark zone that envelops the anvil back here. And the key is that this is a storm-induced dark zone, not pre-existing. In other words, we don't see it here. And then in response to the storm, we see this dark zone develop around the storm. The, the dark zone is likely caused by strong subsidence in the vicinity of a vigorous updraft. Next, we'll look at gravity waves in the context as a hazard for aviation. Gravity waves can be generated by vigorous convection as well as jet streaks, although we have both in this example, I'll discuss the convection. Here we have gravity waves generated by cloud environment interactions spreading from the most vigorous convection, including potentially dangerous turbulence for aviation. The strength of the above cloud turbulence has a strong influence and the occurrence and intensity of above cloud turbulence with strong shear conditions producing the most intense turbulence. So here are the gravity waves that we see, a number of them, 
uh, go later in the loop here. We can see a number of these gravity waves emanating out, out away from these storms here. Here's the sounding from Norman, Oklahoma, that goes along with the previous loop, indicating high cape and strong shear. The shear contributes to the intensity of the turbulence. Frequently, the question in a severe weather forecast is how much clearing will occur so the atmosphere may destabilize. Utilizing water vapor imagery, visible and IR imagery in tandem is the best approach in forecasting cloud cover in severe weather forecasting. For our examples on cloud cover forecast, rather than looking through many forecast model fields to assess severe weather potential, we we'll use the SBC forecast graphics to help us narrow in quickly on the region expecting severe weather, then assess the cloud cover forecast for that region. And for this particular case, we'll be looking in over the plains region. To help us focus in a little more, we'll show the probabilistic tornado forecast from SBC and note the area in the eastern Texas Panhandle and western Oklahoma appears to be at a slightly higher risk of more significant severe weather, in addition to portions of Nebraska and South Dakota. Here is the visible imagery from 13Z to 1730Z on the 7th of May 2005. In the northern sector of Nebraska and South Dakota, there is little cloud cover to impede destabilization up here. Further south across Texas and Oklahoma, we see a fair amount of cloud cover in the moist sector with a region of clearing to the west depicted right here, followed by a region of cirrus in far west Texas and New Mexico. The water vapor imagery over a large scale goes further back. This one starts at 530 UTC and goes through the last time as before, 1730 to look for trends when the improved continuity through the night. Let's focus on the southern plains. West of the clouds in the moist sector, we see the clearing region in the Texas Panhandle, then the region of Cirrus from far west Texas into New Mexico that we observed in the visible imagery, pretty much right in here. Note just upstream of this region in Arizona, we see a fast-moving impulse with considerable cirrus associated with it, just about to reach the aforementioned region of existing cirrus over here. The question is, what effect will this fast-moving impulse have on the existing cirrus and regions further east? We turn to the IR imagery a little bit later in the day. This goes from 1430 to 20 UTC. IR imagery depicts cirrus better than water vapor imagery since we're viewing the cold cirrus against a warm background. Think of the weighting function peaking at low levels versus the water vapor imagery viewing cold cirrus against the cold background. Think of the weighting function peaking at mid-levels. We see the effects of that fast-moving impulse moving in from Arizona causes a considerable increase in the thickness and coverage of the cirrus in far west Texas and New Mexico. We see a dramatic increase in the cirrus further east across the Texas Panhandle, moving towards our forecast area. This is the visible imagery from 19Z to 0Z. We now see the effects of this fast-moving impulse in that we see a considerable increase in the thickness and coverage of the cirrus across the Texas Panhandle at back over the area of interest in Oklahoma and Texas, affecting potential destabilization during the afternoon. The cloud cover appears to have had a significant influence on thunderstorm development in Texas and Oklahoma, whereas further to the north in Nebraska, we see thunderstorms occur in the region far removed from the effects of the cirrus. Here are the SBC storm reports. A number of severe weather reports occurred in Nebraska and South Dakota in the northern sector of interest, and in the southern sector of interest, 
no severe weather reports occurred in western Oklahoma and the eastern Texas panhandle. That's because no thunderstorms developed. The cirrus played a significant role in terms of reducing the insulation, and therefore no thunderstorms occurred in this region. For our next case to consider, we'll look at the SBC Day 2 convective outlook and note the comment about the high clouds. Though surface heating could be inhibited some by high clouds during the day, convection will likely develop across the Texas Panhandle during the afternoon and spread eastward along the boundary and into Oklahoma during the evening. So that high clouds were a concern here in the forecast. This is the visible imagery up to 1515 UTC, the day of the event. Note the extensive cloud cover over the Texas Panhandle during the morning hours. This is a moderate risk area, pretty much right in this area. Will this area clear out in time? That's the question. To help us answer the question, we'll look at the water vapor imagery. The water vapor imagery begins during the nighttime hours and ends at the same time as the vis visible imagery that we just looked at. Note the dry region, or this dark air area, approaching the forecast area. This dark region is associated with the clearing we saw on the previous slide, moving eastward across Arizona and into New Mexico. This should increase confidence in insulation for later so that convective initiation may occur. Here's the visible imagery for the afternoon and evening hours, which show that clearing did indeed take place across the Texas Panhandle where insulation allowed for convective initiation and the development of severe thunderstorms across the risk area. In here are the SBC storm reports associated with the visible imagery that we just looked at. And we can see a number of severe weather reports, including uh, multiple tornado reports. In the next section, we'll look at the utility of GOES water vapor imagery and convective initiation. Here's the water vapor imagery from May 10th of 2005. Note the relatively fast moving lighter region, or these cooler brightness temperatures, moving towards the north. So we see them initially right here over New Mexico, then moving towards the north, northeast across Colorado, Kansas, and Nebraska. We see indications of lift associated with this feature as it moves northward until it intersects a region of high instability and low-level convergence boundary in southern Nebraska, right here. Here's the corresponding visible imagery. We see a patch of cirrus at the leading edge of the feature we discussed in the water vapor imagery, initially over New Mexico, and then moving towards the northeast across Colorado, Kansas, and towards Nebraska. There are indications of forced descent associated with this feature. We see indications of towering cumulus here across northwest Kansas as this cirrus patch approaches, and then as the patch approaches this low-level convergence boundary in Nebraska, we see convective initiation occur. Here's the GFS 250 millibar ice attack analysis valid at 18Z with the corresponding visible imagery. There are indications of a jet streak associated with the feature that we've been discussing. Here's the RUC 250 millibar ice attack analysis at the same time. It's more subtle than the GFS, but the key to remember is believe what you're seeing in the satellite imagery and then use supporting data to gain confidence in the feature and keep it in mind for possible convective initiation along a low-level convergence boundary, as well as providing for a more favorable near-storm environment. This is the profiler data from Granada, Colorado, and southeast Colorado. Times increased to the right. Upper-level winds increased during the middle of the day, and this would provide supporting data for the jet streak that we followed in the satellite imagery. Here's a case from 22 May 2007. We see the trough is centered up here. And there's a jet across Colorado that extends something like this. And we see convective initiation with a storm in western Kansas around 2130 UTC. 
And of particular interest here is note this dark region that ex develops during the afternoon and extends to the south in the position that you would typically see the dry line. Usually you don't see the dry line show up in the water vapor imagery because we're looking at water vapor at mid to upper levels, and of course the dry line is associated with water vapor at low levels. So we'll, we'll ask ourselves the question, is this associated with the dry line as we uh, go through the case here? Another thing to note is later in the loop, we can see what appears to be another jet coming into New Mexico and some higher clouds perhaps associated with that as it moves towards this region. And another question is, will we see later convective initiation a little bit further to the south? Here's the corresponding visible imagery with surface observations that confirm the dark area we observed in the water vapor imagery that's oriented north to south, extending from the storm in Kansas into the Texas Panhandle is associated with a dry line. Usually, in the water vapor imagery, we don't observe the dry line because it's associated with low-level moisture, and the water vapor imagery is peaking above that, and it's usually some mid to higher level. The dark area may correspond to substance, so we could infer substance in the vicinity of the dry line during the afternoon hours after the signature first appears. Let's look at some additional data to help answer this question. Do we see this signature in the GO Sounder 7.4 micron imagery? No, probably the resolution is too coarse for detection. Let's take a cross section across the Oklahoma panhandle as depicted here, and we'll look at relative humidity, wind, and omega, which is shaded. This is from the 12Z NOM run. Let's move forward to 18Z, this is the six hour forecast, and we see a large area of downward motion right here in the vicinity of the dry line. Moving ahead to 21Z, we see the location of the dry line by looking at the low level relative humidity field, the boundary pretty much right in here. Notice that there is a level of strong subsidence just above the moist side of the dry line, around 830 millibars up to about 500 millibars. This would be an inhibiting factor for possible convective initiation along the dry line. We continue to see that signature at 12 hours out to zero Z as well. Now let's look at a plan view of 600 millibar omega and surface wind from the 12 Z NOM. Let's advance forward to 18 Z. And then at 21 Z, we begin to see this strong signal of subsidence right here along and just east of the dry line. This corresponds with the subsidence or dark region we observed in the water vapor imagery and can confidently forecast no thunderstorm development in this region. Here's the visible imagery later in the day zoomed in across the region of interest. Notice a couple indications of attempts at cumulus along the dry line in the Texas Panhandle, just out ahead of some cirrus clouds, perhaps associated with a the jet. These are very brief as the strong subsidence keeps any convection from developing. So to review this case, we looked at the water vapor imagery, saw a signal of strong subsidence developing along the dry line during the afternoon hours, confirmed this with model output, and indeed confidently forecast no convective initiation along the dry line in the Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma Panhandle, further to the south of the convection that we saw in Kansas. The next series of examples asks what we are looking at in the water vapor imagery. In other words, we see something and we don't know what it is. Here's an example from July 4th, 2004. Over Oklahoma and Kansas, we see considerable convection, which results in an MCS that moves off to the east. Behind the MCS, we see indications of an approximately east to west oriented line moving southward across Oklahoma, as depicted here. And then we also see this north to south oriented line that is depicted as drawn in here. And the question is, what are these features that we're observing here in the water vapor imagery? 
Let's look at the weighting function profile based on the 12Z sounding at Norman, Oklahoma. Remember, this data is available on the web, and you can click that See URL button in the Visit View Controls frame to check out any soundings associated weighting function profile. Here, we're looking at the 6.9 and 7.3 micron channels, which are representative of the 6.7 water vapor channel and the 7.4 micron channel that we look at in the GO sounder. The weighting function for the 6.7 water vapor imagery peaks between 300 and 400 millibars, so that the majority of the signal we're seeing is from this layer with rapidly decreasing signal as we go down. The 7.4 micron weighting function looks similar, except it has a secondary peak around 600 millibars and is broader, so we're looking at a greater depth. Let now, let's look at the observed sounding from Norman. Here is the 12Z sounding from Norman, Oklahoma, which was used to derive the weighting function profile that we just looked at. There are multiple inversions of interest, the low-level nocturnal inversion, a subsidence inversion up here around 470 millibars, and I want you to keep that mid-level inversion in mind as we continue to look at more imagery. Here is the ghost sounder 7.4 micron imagery. Keep in mind that the spatial and temporal resolution is coarser than the ghost 6.7 micron water vapor imagery. The data is only available hourly and is greater than 10 kilometer horizontal resolution. There are indications of the east-west oriented line moving southward through here. However, it's more subtle than the 6.7 water vapor imagery, likely due to coarser horizontal resolution. The north to south oriented line we observed in the 6.7 micron imagery is undetectable here. The visible imagery shows additional details with its improved spatial resolution. The north to south oriented line appears to be an undular bore. The cloud top height algorithm from the IR imagery indicates these clouds to be around 550 millibars. Remember, in the morning sounding from Norman, a subsidence inversion exists around 470 millibars. Typically, clouds associated with an undular bore exist at low levels, less than the cloud heights observed here. Recall, in the water vapor imagery, we didn't see multiple north to south oriented lines, just one dividing line, so to speak, in the north to south direction. Clouds associated with an undular bore typically do not show up in the water vapor imagery, which is consistent with what is observed here. Perhaps the north to south boundary we see here is a gravity wave at the western edge of the undular bore with origins associated with outflow from the MCS. The east to west oriented line appears in the water vapor imagery prior to convective initiation. Then convection develops along a segment of this line in southern Kansas. This east to west line continues to move south, and although it corresponds closely to the outflow associated with the storms on the visible imagery in southeast Oklahoma, the absence of this feature in the visible imagery, along with the fact it was observed in the water vapor imagery prior to convective initiation, should give support to the idea that what we're looking at is a gravity wave. Also, surface observations do not show a wind shift with the passage of this east to west line. Here's an example from April of 2001. Focus your attention on southwest Kansas and southeast Colorado. This area appears to be under a strong upper-level jet. During the late afternoon hours, we see a northwest to southeast oriented line or darker region in this region. I'll go ahead and draw it in right here. It develops during the late afternoon, and it appears to be moving towards the northeast and we see a storm develop in the vicinity of that line later in the day. The question is, what is this feature, and does it have any effect on convective initiation? Here's the GOES Sounder 7.4 micron imagery during the same time period. Note that the feature of interest that we just looked at does not appear in the imagery. 
we do see a dark region that ex originates over the Texas Panhandle and moves to the northeast, however. Here's the corresponding visible imagery, and we can overlay the METARs. With a surface low to the west, we see rapid vection of moisture towards the northwest. A warm front is situated across Kansas that extends back to a dry line. And convective initiation occurs pretty much in this region here along the triple point, as well as further east along the warm front. The feature of interest that we talked about earlier in the water vapor imagery is likely a gravity wave Although studies have shown that gravity waves can initiate deep moist convection, it's impossible to say here what role the gravity wave played in convective initiation since we had well-defined surface features. The key is to get experience looking at the water vapor imagery, recognizing these types of features so that in the future you'll be able to quickly identify features that may play a role in convective development. Now let's look at a case from April of 2007. The 10.7 micron imagery can detect a dry line in the absence of clouds due to the weighting function being at low level so that low level moisture can be seen. Later in the loop, as the sun is setting, the dry air, which is to the west here, cools off faster than the moist air, which is further to the east. The moist region east of the dry line has warmer brightness temperatures or darker in this color table while the dry air to the west here has cooler brightness temperatures or lighter in this color table. And we can overlay the observations to see that there's good agreement with the location of the dry line. Here's the water vapor imagery for the same time period as the IR loop we just looked at. Note that the dry line actually shows up in the water vapor imagery and we can prove that to ourselves by, again, overlaying the METARs. And we have darker or warmer brightness temperatures on the moist side and lighter or cooler brightness temperatures on the west side. Why does low-level moisture show up in the water vapor imagery, which should be seen mostly at mid to upper levels? Let's look at the weighting function profile based on the 0Z Amarillo, Texas sounding. And here we will focus on the green line, which is the 6.9 micron, which corresponds closely with the 6.7 micron water vapor imagery we just looked at. Here we actually see a double peak, not only the typical maximum in the vicinity of 400 millibars, but also a maximum in the vicinity of 600 millibars. In this particular example, we're seeing lower in the atmosphere due to favorable atmospheric conditions. What are those favorable conditions? Well, here's the Amarillo sounding, and in this situation, the conditions are just right to view the moisture at lower levels. There's very dry air at mid to upper levels, which allows us to see further down into the region of higher relative humidity that begins just below 600 millibars. And remember, that's where that secondary peak in the weighting function profile was. So we actually are seeing in this region further down where the moisture exists. Here's a case from May of 1996. And what we'll do here is identify various features that we've discussed throughout this training session as a review. First of all, we see this dark region that begins over in Colorado and moves across Kansas. This is a short wave. It's moving across the region. Just to the west of that, we see this elongated feature right here, this lighter region, which appears to be a jet streak. Storms go up in this vicinity here in southwest Nebraska. Also, notice the storm in southwest Nebraska has the storm-induced dark zone signature. It's a very intense storm as it goes from southwest Nebraska into northwest Kansas. We also see a, a dark zone signature with the storms in Texas down here as well. And we see associated with this convection in Oklahoma some gravity waves emanating out away from this particular feature as well. Finally, Notice near the end of this loop, I'll go ahead and stop it and 
slowly advance along here. Stop it right here, and we see this line pretty much right here, where we see darker brightness temperatures over here and lighter brightness temperatures to the west. And the question is, is this associated with the dry line? We'll help answer that by looking at the surface observations in the next slide. Here's the surface observations at 22Z, and you can see the dry line does indeed correspond to the dark line we observed in the water vapor imagery. And by 0Z, you can see this dry line bulge down here, which was also evident in the water vapor imagery. So every now and then, it can show up in the water vapor imagery. It doesn't show up that often, but uh, when it does, just to have an understanding of why you're seeing the dry line in the water vapor imagery. Here's the weighting function profile associated with the sounding at Dodge City. Remember that most of the time, low-level features will not appear in the water vapor imagery. However, occasionally they do, as we showed in this presentation. Knowing what you're looking at will increase your situ awareness, situational awareness so you won't be caught off guard, so to speak. You may view weighting function profiles in real time on the SIMS website, which you can bring up in the show or the CURL button down here in the Visit View Controls frame, or go to the student guide for this training session, and you'll find a link on there as well. In the future, when GOES-R becomes available, there will be much improved spatial and temporal resolution, as well as more channels. This will allow corresponding improvement in satellite imagery interpretation to increase your situational awareness. We discussed the use of the GOES Sounder 7.4 micron channel during this presentation, a channel that has uses but is limited by the hourly temporal resolution and greater than 10 kilometer spatial resolution. On GOES-R, this channel will be available every five minutes and look very similar to the MODIS channel that we see over here, the 7.3 channel. Compare the two images here at the same time and you can see significant potential utility with this channel when GOES-R comes along. Synthetic imagery, that is imagery that is derived from model output, exists now in the form of CRAS, the WARF ARW, and will continue to improve so that comparison with GOES data allows for better model assessment. Refer to the visit web pages for a training session on severe weather applications of the WARF ARW synthetic imagery. On the left-hand side here, you see the synthetic imagery from the WARF ARW model. We're looking at the simulated water vapor channel. It's actually 6.9 microns, which is very close to the observed 6.7 micron channel that we observe on GOES. This is for the severe weather event of April 24, 2010 that took place in the southeast. The synthetic imagery can be used to look at features such as short waves and jet streaks associated with dark regions. A comparison of short-term forecast with GOES imagery allows one to have greater or less confidence in these features. This imagery may also be used for cloud cover applications, such as what we discussed earlier with cloud coverage for air mass destabilization. So again, for more information on this type of application, look at the visit web pages for the training session that deals with this. Here's the synthetic imagery from the WARF ARW. This is for the 7.3 micron channel, which is representative of the GOES Sounder 7.4 micron channel. And until GOES-R comes along and is available, the synthetic imagery from this channel can also be used in tandem with the existing GOES Sounder 7.4 channel to fill in the gaps, so to speak, in the hourly data that is available, and also get a look at much greater spatial resolution than the course data that is currently available. Of course, this comes with the usual limitations of interpreting model output, but is worthwhile until we get the much improved spatial and temporal resolution that will become available with GOES-R. For conclusions, we use the water vapor imagery during severe weather forecasting to identify short waves and jet streaks, also assess cloud coverage, for destabilization, of course, using that with visible imagery and the IR imagery as well. We identified gravity waves 
also looked at the storm-induced dark zone signature. We utilized the 7.4 micron imagery available on the GOES sounder to analyze mid-level jet streaks and also looking at, at the relationship to the elevated mixed layer.